Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another webinar at the National Library of Scotland. My name is Ken Redpath, and I'm the events officer at the library. Tonight, I'm delighted to be introducing Dr. Laura Rattray, who's here to give us a talk on American author Edith Wharton as part of our Women History Month series of events. This webinar has proved another real success for us here, as over 300 people have booked for it. We have people from not just the UK, but viewers from China, India, Tunisia, the Maldives, and of course, many from the USA. We certainly are reaching out to people, something I surely didn't expect to be doing so much a year ago. You are all very, very welcome. Laura is reader in American literature at the University of Glasgow. She has teaching and research interests in modern, modern American literature and culture, women's writing and gender, editing and publishing history. In 2016, she founded the series Cultural Connections, Transatlantic Literary Women, funded by the British Association for American Studies, and the US Embassy Small Grants Programme. Publications include 21st Century Readings of Tender is the Night, Edith Horton in Context, the Oxford World Classics Edition of Summer, and the two-volume critical edition and published writings of Edith Horton. Her new monograph, Edith Horton and Genre Beyond Fiction, is published by Paul Grave Macmillan. She is on the editorial board of the Edith Wharton Review, a board member of the Edith Wharton Society, and is currently working with Susan Barrow on the edition of Letters Important to the, to the art historians, Bernard and Mary Berenson. One thinks, one thinks, and I just got a tiny feeling here, we have quite a specialist on our subject matter tonight. But before handing over to Laura, can I just say that there will be time for questions at the webinar. So please get thinking and just type your questions into the Q&A function and we will do our very best to get through as many as we can. But for now, I'm delighted to say over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Kenny. Many thanks to you and to Joe for the invitation and for the lovely warm welcoming. Welcome and many congratulations on the brilliant series of events that you've been running at the National Library of Scotland throughout this lockdown. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be talking to you today. And while part of me would love to be there in person, I'm excited that we're joined as we just heard from Kenny by people from many different parts of, of the world for a conversation about Edith Wharton. And thank you all very much for being here. Damn distances and frontiers, exclaimed Edith Wharton, when she really wanted to be seeing friends, not writing to them. But Edith Wharton did not have Zoom. Okay, so this is the moment where I hold my breath and try to sh share my screen with you all. Okay. Okay, I can relax now. When Edith Wharton died in France in August 1937 at the age of 75, the international press mourned the passing of a novelist, a noted novelist, a great novelist, one of the greatest novelists, but certainly a novelist. The New York Times headlined Edith Wharton, 75, is dead in France. Novelist wrote Ethan Frome, The Age of Innocence, and 36 other books. Chronicler of inner circles of New York society in which she had been reared. The Washington Post recorded, Edith Wharton dies of stroke at 75 
in her French chateau and fell back on the cliches. Novelist rival of Henry James reached peak in Ethan Frome. And the Scotsman held up two qualifications. One of the foremost American women novelists. She was 75. And it's an extraordinary back catalogue, isn't it? The texts mentioned most frequently in the autobiographies, Ethan Frome, in fact, a novella, its merciless ending likened to Greek tragedy by contemporary reviewers. Three lives in supreme torture, Mrs. Wharton's Ethan Frome, a cruel, compelling, haunting story of New England. The House of Mirth, with Wharton's pr protagonist Lily Bart in a very precarious position on the edges of New York society, needing to marry and marry well, her beauty transient. I'm sure many of you have read the novel and that scene where she's looking and spots a line in the mirror, a reminder that time is running out. I've been about too long. People are getting tired of me. They are beginning to say I ought to marry. Isn't marriage your vocation? Isn't it what you're all brought up for? She sighed. I suppose so. What else is there? The Age of Innocence, Wharton's first big novel published after the First World War, where she goes back to the New York of her childhood, the novel for which she would be awarded the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, the first woman to win the award. But there were so many Edith Whartons. A novelist, yes, it's an important part, but she's so accomplished that it is only part of the story. What of those 36 other books? Of the, in fact, 43 books published during her lifetime, a third falls outside the categories of novel, novella, short stories, and that's a lot of work. Go into the archives and include the numerous other texts that were uncollected, sometimes unpublished, and it equates to an even more substantial and significant body of work. And from the 1920s, Edith Wharton was in a relatively precarious position herself. On the one hand, she'd won the Pulitzer. She was internationally acclaimed. She was earning more money than she'd ever made from her work. And Wharton made a fortune from her writing, describing it as her business as well as her passion. And on the other hand, this was the period in which she began to be regarded as yesterday's writer, as old fashioned, a throwback, an anachronism, out of step with the younger generation. And she certainly had her thoughts on this. As early as June 1925, she writes to a friend, as my work reaches its close, I feel so sure that it is either nothing or far more than they know, and I wonder a little desolately which. And in an interview the year before her death, she offered up an expert deconstruction of her critical reception. Criticism of my work seems to run in cycles. When a critic thinks up a good label for me, it lasts about 10 years. And now she said, this violet and old lace affair it's startling to find that phrase creeping into a review of my latest book of short stories, especially since most of them deal with grim subjects, including suicide and murder. I was once called, you know, a revolutionary writer. Critics then talked about my audacious treatment of unpleasant themes. And I'm talking today about some of these other Edith Whartons, often sidelined, obscured by the force of these popular misconceptions. I'm focused very much on the writing today, but I do want to mention Wharton, the war veteran, first up, and her phenomenal relief work during the First World War. As some of you know, she's in her 50s when the war breaks out. She's based in France. 
and she doesn't head off out of the way straight into the comfort zone. She throws herself wholeheartedly into relief work. And when you're Edith Wharton, that's industrial scale fundraising, founding hostels and hospitals, sanitaria for people recovering from TB, offering practical assistance to the many, many Belgian refugees. She sets up and runs ouvroir workrooms for women who've been displaced so that they can earn a living through their sewing. And she uses her contacts to ensure orders for their work. She makes five visits to the front line and she writes about them for US newspapers trying to influence American public opinion. And she's furious about their perceived neutrality. And the New York Sun headlines in November 1915, no woman, probably no man not engaged in military service has seen so much of the war. And it's a sign of the scale of her work that eventually the American Red Cross would take over many of her charities. And here she is seeing some of the devastation for herself. And in a huge archive of Wharton papers at Yale University, perhaps the most poignant item in it is a shard of glass from the bombed cathedral at Reims um, that Wharton preserved, um, deeply affected by World War I. On a lighter note, probably many of us have seen the charming dare I say, faintly ridiculous photos of Edith Wharton with her dogs. And Wharton was also a committed animal welfare campaigner. And this was one area where her literary success was a useful tool in ensuring publicity for her causes. When her committee work for the ASPCA was reported in Vogue, she was listed as Mrs. Edward Wharton, then in parentheses, the Mrs. Edith Wharton of literary fame. And with the writing, yes, Wharton was a novelist and so much more. And I was working on a book, Edith Wharton and Genre Beyond Fiction, the book I've aged over. Lily, I see you those lines and I raise you. Uh, and it's really about all of that other work because Wharton was one of the most versatile writers of her lifetime. She was a gifted, prolific poet, a controversial playwright, a trailblazing travel writer, a hugely influential writer in the fields of architecture and design. She was an innovative literary critic. She was a writer who overturned the conventional hierarchies of modern autobiography. And these other genres, they weren't momentary sidesteps, brief diversions from what has long been regarded as her primary role as a novelist and to some extent as a short story writer. Instead, each genre was pursued fully, wholeheartedly and spoke to Wharton's very sense of herself as an artist and her connected, cohesive vision of artistry and art, the genres nourishing and supporting each other. This is a writer who repeatedly tells us she loathes shortcuts. And I think these genres have been sidelined over the years. And, and one of the consequences of that is it's left us at times with a rather tame version of Edith Wharton. And it's through these neglected, sometimes completely overlooked genres that we often see Wharton, the writer, actually at her boldest, most adventurous, most socially conscious, feminist, subversive, and downright radical at times, which however much she's admired, aren't often epithets that we necessarily apply to Edith Wharton. And this diverse narrative has often been obstructed by a series of restricted, limited scripts. The society novelist, the grand dame, the anti-modernist, the writer who lost touch, the writer of the elite. How is it that the writer who works in all of these fields, who, as we'll see, writes about child prostitution, poverty, child suicide, euthanasia, vivisection, incest, 
somehow she's been allowed to be considered as a safe writer. And as a woman, many of us have realised Wharton isn't always the person we like her to be. And Wharton scholarship has been quite good at acknowledging that in re recent years, I think. For example, this was a woman who could at times be biased against women. Um, here's a letter to her sister-in-law, Minnie Jones, Mary Cadwell Jones. I'm not much interested in travelling scholarships for women, or in fact in scholarships to core. They'd much better stay at home and mind the baby. Thank you, Edith. When encouraged by Mary Berenson to read her daughter Ray Strachey's volume, The Cause, charting the history of the British women's movement, Wharton countered to read a book called The Cause, and that cause will require all my affection for you. And both comments you've probably noticed are made in the decade of women's suffrage. And there's quite an irony um, that we're talking about her today as part of Women's History Month. And Edith Wharton would have been, at best, very ambivalent about the idea of Women's History Month. So she doesn't always make it easy for us. But she believed that women mattered, that women mattered just as much as men. She creates one of the most remarkable galleries of women in her work. She exposes the double standards, the hypocrisies, the constraints that bind them. And she would hate the term feminism, but it's often in the genres outside the novel, novella and short story, that we see displayed most clearly an unfettered, unapologetic feminism in her work. And partly as a result, it's often again in these less familiar genres that we see revealed the writer encountering and really battling much greater and more pernicious levels of sexism in both the production and reception of her work that is generally acknowledged. More of that later. Um, I don't have time to talk about all the genres, you'll be relieved to hear. I could go on for weeks, so I'm going to focus on a selection. As Kenny says, please do put any questions in the, the chat, I'd love to, to hear from you. But I wanted to start off today with Wharton as a playwright. And Wharton was interested in playwriting from beginning to end of her career. And in fact, all of the evidence suggests now that at the turn of the century, she was as probably more interested in being a playwright than in being a novelist. Who would have thought? And her ease in this genre spans deft comedies of manners with the great witty one-liners to grittier realities of unprivileged lives. And not least, playwriting spoke to two of Wharton's greatest creative gifts, dialogue and character. She recalls in her manuscript draft, Life and I, that she actually learned to read by reading a highly unsuitable play. When I recall, she writes at the end there, how carefully my reading was supervised from that hour to the day of my marriage. It seems odd that it should have begun with the story of a prostitute. In a manuscript draft of A Little Girl's New York, we have childhood recollections of theatre and play acting. When asked in her rash youth whether she enjoyed the theatre, Wharton recalled her response. Well, I always want to get up on the stage and show them how they ought to act. A reply noted the writer, naturally interpreted as proof of intolerable arrogance. And when she recalls writing her first novel at the ripe old age of 11, its opening line is dialogue. Of course it is. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Brown, said Mrs. Tompkins. If only I'd known you were going to call, I should have tidied up the drawing room. Timorously, I submitted this to my mother, and never shall I forget the sudden drop of my creative frenzy when she returned it with the icy comment. After three now, drawing rooms are always tidy. Edith Jones, the young Edith Wharton, clearly not the only member of the family with a gift for zinging one-liners. 
Early original plays by Wharton include the social comedy, The Man of Genius, The Arch, an untitled play, The Necklace, and The Shadow of a Doubt. And her playwriting shows her openness to experimentation, her appropriation and subversion of dramatic stereotypes, her harnessing of controversial plot lines, on occasions her embrace of populist melodrama, on others her deployment of minimalism and quiet economy in what otherwise would have been a sensationalist drama. A number of her plays offer plot and character prototypes of playwriting techniques on the novels that in many ways came to define her career. And I think one of the exciting things working on Wharton, I'm very happy to talk more about this in the questions, she's such a prolific writer and yet there are other manuscripts out there that we haven't got our hands on, on yet. They really are there and most certainly in the genre of playwriting. The Man of Genius is a social comedy set in England, concerns the trials and tribulations of a successful novelist. The genius in question is Claude Hartwood, a renowned writer struggling to complete his latest novel, and he's caught up in a web of misunderstandings and mistaken identities. And in an impassioned outburst, he vents his frustrations to his wife. Did it never strike you, Belle? that works of art are like children, that they need care and love and congenial surroundings to grow strong and beautiful in. He lays his hand on his manuscript. This ought to have been my best book, and it's nothing but a poor, misshapen, mutilated failure. And the play has lots of discussions of creative processes framed throughout with the comedic business of misunderstandings, mistaken identities husband and wife separate, but all will be resolved in what will become unfamiliar territory for Wharton readers, a projected happy ending. Hartwood is a man who is, of all things, in love with his wife. And the man of genius really showcases many of Wharton's literary gift, that deafness, that lightness of touch, the great wit, the wonderful one-liners. And tucked away in a box of plays at the, the archive in Yale is the incomplete manuscript of a play that has no title, scenario, no page one, just to be helpful, so no identifying cast of characters. So it's variable in quality, it's rough and unpolished, but I wanted to mention it because it takes a very unexpected turn from its English upper class setting to transform into one of Wharton's boldest and most socially conscious dramas. At the outset, we have two society ladies discussing a problem. A friend is pregnant and not pregnant by her husband, and they're worried about the, the fallout of, on, of this um, because one of the wives needs the backing of the woman's husband. It is, says Mrs. Lias, a beastly fix. And so you think you're into what we recognize as familiar territory of high society manipulation and maneuvering, but then it's suddenly and quite dramatically transformed when the focus shifts to reveal that Lady Julian is not the only expectant mother. There is also Mrs. Frame's unmarried pregnant maid. And a situation that can be managed in the higher echelons is a disaster on the bottom rungs of the social ladder and the language of the privileged classes casts its censorious hue. Horror, contaminated, perfectly horrible, corrupting, disgusting. Pregnancy for Alice Wing threatens disgrace, permanent employment, she's to be denied a reference from her employer. So penury for herself, her unborn child, but also the mother and sister her work supports. And there's a convenient employment of ellipses in the text with little open mention of pregnancy, of sex, abortion, illegitimacy. But these topics are very explicit presences on the page. And what really exposes the classic double standards and the different views of, of social behaviour. And we have here um, the butler, who is also the father of the child, as we find out, coming to the bold, outspoken defence. 
Have you ever asked yourself, sir, what sort of lives we have, living so close to money and pleasure and freedom? Um, supposing, sir, um, she gets to wondering why the two of them, one should have all the fun and the other all the work. Henry, how much longer is this to last? And we often see in Wharton's fictions, don't we, our cast of highly versatile actresses skillfully changing roles as the occasion demands. Those who know the House of Mirth, the tableau vivant scene with Lily. Think of the opening scene, those who know the Age of Innocence, where it opens up in the theatre and we realise that the more um, scripted, intricate um, story is actually going on in the auditorium off stage. So pivotal scenes taking place in the theatre and we see the legacy of that interest there. And one other play I wanted to mention, The Shadow of a Doubt, um, a play that Wharton scholars were unaware existed until 2016 and my brilliant colleague Mary Chinnery and I were really excited to, to work on this. Um, and we came across press coverage in 1901 of this play, The Shadow of a Doubt, and thought, what's this? We've never heard of this. It's not in any of the bio biographies. Nobody's heard of it at all. And we started to look for it. And again, it's early, 1901. So before she ever writes a novel, before The House of Mirth. And this is the play that of all of them comes closest to commercial success. It goes into production in Broadway in 1901 under the helm of Charles Froman, one of the leading theatre producers of the age. Elsie de Wolfe is cast in the leading role. And what a topic, a plotline of euthanasia, assisted suicide, is at the heart of this piece. And there are revelations that the character of Kate Derwent, um, formerly a professional nurse, has helped her husband's first wife to die after she had begged for an end to her pain. And instead of making Wharton the villainous figure, um, Wharton makes her a figure of quiet integrity and honour who elects to give up her newly acquired life of luxury because her husband doubts that she acted out of compassion. And Wharton really refuses her audience an easy, unquestioning, condemnatory stance, inviting instead recognition of euthanasia as this very complex moral issue. So to write a play pivoting on a theme of euthanasia for the commercial stage was brave, was controversial, and it may be one reason um, for Froman's production being abruptly shelved. So it looked like it was going to be the success, it was in rehearsal on Broadway, and then it didn't happen. And this play, I think, really shows us what Wharton um, could do as a playwright. And there are links to um, future novels. It moves down the social scale in the final act. And there are echoes of, of the House of Mirth. She'll pick up the theme of euthanasia in her 1907 novel, The Fruit of the Tree. It's a very busy novel, The Fruit of the Tree. There are a lot of completing storylines, whereas it's much clearer in the shadow of, of, of a doubt. Um, and there's a lot of interest in this. This is not a bad day for me and Mary in the office. And um, I think it really speaks to the ongoing fascination with, with Wharton that the story was picked up and that there was real interest in it. So the production's thwarted um, and it's over a century later that it finally got its premiere on BBC Radio 3 in a production directed by Emma Harding. And I'll just mention here that when hard times hit in terms of the Great Depression, Wharton's very grateful for the income from the adaptations of her plays. They keep her going and here she is writing with glee in 1936 that she's sustained by the regular click of coin in my savings box as the three old plays, two old maids, three plays, two old maids and one Ethan continue their fruitful rounds. 
And I wanted to talk um, a little about Edith Wharton as a poet because she's a prolific poet. And again, we hardly ever talk about her as a poet. She published three collections of poetry and scores and scores of individual poems, most of which um, the individual ones unpublished in her lifetime. And there's such an ease and range of genre and form. She's very difficult to categorize, which I think is one reason her work in the genre hasn't had the attention it deserves. After all, who are her contemporaries? She's praised by Longfellow at the beginning of her career and dismissed by T.S. Eliot at the end of it. And the poetry was really central to Wharton's sense of herself as a writer. Um, there's a volume of verse called Verse published privately when she's 16. And then here she is at the age of uh, 17. Um, poems, some published in the newspapers. Here's one, Only a Child, about a, a young boy who kills himself when he's locked up in a reformatory. And there's a real um, tone of social indignation in this poem. They found him hanging dead, you know, in the cell where he had lain, in a Christian town, it happened, in a home for children built. And it's a great reminder, a lot of the poetry, but Wharton doesn't just write about the elite. So much more of her work than we acknowledge is about the poor, the unprivileged, the dispossessed. She writes a poem about responses to a late Irish famine. There's a wonderful poem, The Rose, about a homeless woman struggling to feed her children. And Wharton's quite radical in her treatment of poverty in these poems. She doesn't demonize, she doesn't other. The poor could be any one of us could be you, could be me, fallen on hard times. This poem here, Cynthia, a poem about a child prostitute. Cynthia isn't even her name, it's the name that she's, she's given by the man who seems to be rescuing her. One's got a great line in dramatic monologues. Here's one, Margaret Co of Cortona, which reminds us what a controversial writer Wharton could be. So this is published in 1901, the same year as The Shadow of a Doubt. Um, so she's got a play causing controversy and here's her poetry causing an uproar in the Catholic press. There's a woman here making a confession that she wouldn't be in the church at all if she hadn't lost her lover. Think I wouldn't leave this Christ for that? He was my Christ. So a highly blasphemous message. And there was such a furore that the editor had to issue an apology on behalf of both of them. Was Edith Wharton sorry? I don't think so because she later included it in her volume of poetry and made no changes to the offending passages. And in her dramatic monologue, she often revises them as a feminist script. She'll give us a dramatic monologue where the man is silenced, the woman speaks, often a scorned, shamed woman, and she claims the account of her life, and Wharton refuses to demonise and judge. And the critical response to Wharton's poetry was generally patronising, condescending, and at times downright sexist. Here she is in 19. 09 and her poetry she's regarded as an apprentice writer. The dramatic monologues owe more to Browning than to their foster mother. In sonnet form, Miss Wharton should someday achieve something, mansplained the Manchester Guardian. And here in form she is nearer classical standards, though she has none of the rich imaginative vigour of Mr. Hewlett, Maurice Hewlett's poems published at the same time, not for the first and not for the last time, Wharton held up to a male writer and found to be wanting. And drawing on that theme, I wanted briefly to mention architecture and design. And there's the decoration of houses, which is hugely um, influential which she um, works on with Ogden Codman Jr. And then Italian villas and their gardens. And again, Wharton um, gets into difficulties here. She's very authoritative, knowledgeable, confident. She takes it seriously. 
She researches almost 80 villas, Vernon Lee pointing her in the direction of others. Um, it's a really authoritative piece of research. And then the editors come back to her. They're very happy with Maxfield Parish's illustrations, and you can see two of them here. They're not so happy with Wharton's text, which they think requires levity, requires dilution. They want Edith Wharton to be chatty. And Edith Wharton tells them what they can do with chatty. She's just not having it and she refuses to be compromised. Although there's a kind of punishment going on there, but as a consequence, they refuse to include the architectural plans, designs that she felt were so crucial to the text. And some of the reviews said, wondered where they were. So she did pay a price for that. The woman punished for stepping out of line. Critical writings and literary theory. There's very little discussion of Wharton's work in this field. And when there is, it's usually suggested that this is an area in which Wharton is timid, which is uncertain, which she's hesitant. We'll see. When she's reviewing for the Bookman, a study of George Eliot by Leslie Stephen, father of Virginia Woolf, um, the series first study of a woman, she really takes to task the terms of reference that, um, that he uses and he really challenges him. And she says here, um, is it because these were men while George Eliot was a woman that she is reproved for venturing on ground that they did not fear to tread? And I think we see her coming up with quite a feminist alternative agenda. For example, she takes male writers to task in her reviews for the approach she's taking. She blasts them for being incapable of creating convincing female characterizations. Um, and here she is, Maurice Hewlett's The Fool Errant, 1905. So four years before her poetry will be kept compared to his. And she's discussing his female character. Virginia Strozzi starts out, for instance, thin to emaciation and pale to the point of evanescence. But as the novelist warms to his subject, and Mr. Hewlett is nothing if not warm, she grows into the high bosomed beauty with whom his pen habitually consorts. One can only assume that Mr. Hewlett, bored by the company of a thin girl with no colour, has let his imagination momentarily stray to more congenial society. And do I need to duck for this one? Um, she admires Walt Scott in many ways, but not when it comes to, to, to women. She condemns his keepsake insipidities and calls him conventional and hypocritical when he touched on love and women. And in 1925, she brings out a whole volume of, of criticism. And it's a fascinating text, the way she structures it. She puts the short story first. It's a very generous um, uh, vision. She talks about chocolatiers and sempstresses. She sees all of these creative art forms uh, linked. She doesn't see it as, as a particularly elitist form. She thinks genius is essential, but it's also all about hard graft. She shows space for change, for difference. And you see talk of fluidity here, an art in the making. She's not rule bound. She says general rules in art are useful chiefly as a lamp in a mine or a handrail down a black stairway. They are necessary for the sake of guidance they give, but it is a mistake once they are formulated to be too much in all of them. And I think she legitimizes in this volume individual space. She opens up a less elitist um, vision. And it's quite different from other volumes in that it's not designed for the armchair reader, but really for the practicing writer. And she talks about the pressures that young writers are under, the pressure to produce quickly, to produce more and more of the same. It's never a vision, as I say, that's boys club. It's never about men, men only. And I'm suggesting that Wharton's been subjected to much fiercer, more pernicious levels of sexism throughout her career than we've acknowledged, and nowhere more so 
than in the reception of this innovative volume, The Writing of Fiction. And it's a volume that's generally misremembered as this kind of anti-modernist howl. Wharton seemed to be trespassing on a male literary terrain. Wharton seemed to be lacking. And the reviews of this volume are quite interesting. There's a reason this slide is in black, J.B. Priestley, um, because even if they prof profess to like the book, there's a quite literal belittling of Wharton and her work, a little study, a little volume. And again, she's held up to a male writer and found to be wanting, Percy Lubbock's The Craft of Fiction. Scattered notes instead of a closely woven argument like that of Mr Lubbock. And in case we missed it, it's repeated. The fact that her study is slight and scrappy, a bundle of notes rather than a closely woven argument, makes it disappointing. Times Literary Supplement. It is amusing to compare what she says of particular novelists with what Mr Percy Lubbock says of them. And here's Priestley um, again. Um, he sees the field of criticism. The criticism of fiction is still a gigantic virgin continent. And he sees James and Lubbock doing great things. And then along comes Mrs. Wharton, brings up the rear, taking a trip on this railway and occasionally making not unladylike excursions into the surrounding jungle. And by the time she writes this volume, 1925, she's in her 60s, she's internationally acclaimed, she's won the Pulitzer Prize, she's earning more money than ever. Can you imagine a male writer being diminished and demeaned in that way? I disagreed with, yes. But I think the message would still be taken seriously. But here, Wharton comes under attack. And to close, I wanted briefly to mention the life writings. Wharton has several goes at writing her own life and she has good reasons to do so. Um, if you look at the media coverage for Wharton across her life. And her most important intervention, you've seen some of the drafts with some of the text from the slides. But the most important published intervention in the life writings is a backward glance. Um, published in 1934. And there's something of an autobiographical boom, autobiography boom in the 1930s. And Wharton is, is part of that. She taps into that, but she also resists it. And it's a memoir that's often thought of as discreet and evasive, the grand dame not giving too much away. And it was serialized, Wharton liked to do this because it was another payday beginning the recollections of a great literary career. And a six month serialization ran in the Ladies Home Journal from October, 1933. Um, and it was very substantially cut. And the journal editor was very forthright when he read an early submission. He said that it was snooty and consciously, so consciously intellectual that it would be over the heads of a tremendous portion of a popular audience, he wrote. And Wharton's paragraphs were brusquely filleted, divided up into short units, all the French words were taken out, scenes in Europe condensed or omitted. And he also tried to get Wharton to reduce her fee from $25,000 to $20,000. Here we are in the height of the depression and Wharton threatened to sue him and she got her money. And the advertising context of this journal tells its own story. All of the ads were to young um, housewives, young womanhood. I was a bit worried about cooking my first turkey Thanksgiving. Coleman's mustard came to the rescue kind of thing. And here we have pictures of a mother and daughter heralding beauty from teens to forties. The lovely picture of mother and daughter is convincing evidence of the fact that beauty no longer depends on age. So the ad spoke to young womanhood, wifehood, motherhood, and the same magazine that rendered a woman beyond her 40s invalid and invisible, paid its 71-year-old female contributor 
an unprecedented fee. So here she is still breaking the mold. And in a letter responding to criticism of um, um, a, a backward glance, Wharton said that she felt like Lady Godiva when she was writing it, but she understood from the reviews that she was regarded as being too discreet. And I think what she's doing in this autobiography is really challenging what are the big marker events of, of life, the big Lady Godiva moments, if you like. And she decides they're not marriage, not children, not career triumphs, or nights with a lover in a Charing Cross hotel, which is a whole different story. But instead, they're the adventures with books, um, the quiet, the life of the imagination, connections, the intellect. Um, and Wharton's establishing a very different kind of autobiography and very different hierarchies of importance in striking opposition to the decades of tabloid coverage that followed her. So under this benevolent gaze, and this is the image that was used of a ground down portrait of another age, readers were actually being offered quite a radical subversive take on what constituted an autobiography and the signpost events of life. So bold, unexpected, and all in the presence of this formal studio portrait, choker pearls, fur drape, hands concealed by a fur muff, the suggestion of a woman belonging to another age. Life is always either a tightrope or a feather bed, Wharton wrote in a notebook in March 1926. And I think in a backward glance, once again, she imaginatively walks the tightrope above the parameters of conventional autobiography on her own high wire path. And under the gaze, of this grand dame, this work read as discreet and old fashioned, was suggesting instead new life writings for a new age. So redirect the spotlight to some of these less familiar genres. And I think we see different Whartons coming to the fore, bold, experimental, versatile, controversial, at times radical Edith Whartons coming to the fore. And I think Wharton herself put it best. My final slide, she writes in January 1919, I have always known what I wanted and done it. And quite frankly, she did. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>